everybody. Welcome to this week's Roundup. Just a reminder that Retro World Expo is about a month away, and I am very excited to be there. This is the first year they're doing three days instead of two. It starts at Friday afternoon, and I'll be there the whole time. So I really hope to meet as many of you as possible as can make it, but let's jump in and see what we've got going on this week. First up, My Life in Gaming recently posted a video showcasing the Xbox 360 store, which is closing down on Monday. And Mark basically went through his Xbox 360 and kind of went through all of the different things that he'd purchased over the years, really just to kind of half as a walk down memory lane, but also just to show you what still might be available, even at a very large discount. There's a bunch of games that are available for a dollar or two. So if you're still a user of the Xbox 360 and you want to check out some of those games that might not be available to to you at all anymore come next week, then I would really check out their video, kind of see what they think, see which games kind of stood the test of time since they got them, and just, you know, sit back and enjoy a good My Life in Gaming video. Next up, some more Xbox 360 news. Durf from the Console Mods Wiki recently wrote a script called the Zifu Spoofer, which allows you to choose which version of the Xenon Fusion emulator that you'd like to use with your jailbroken Xbox 360 when trying to force backward compatibility of games. So let's back up for a minute and go through this real quick. The Xbox 360 was able to play original Xbox games using the Xenon Fusion emulator. And there were only a handful of games that were whitelisted to be run on this. But if you have a jailbroken 360, you could bypass that and just run whatever original Xbox games you have. Some will work and some won't, and some have different varying degrees of bugs. However, over the years, while there has been a detailed list created of which games do run, it's possible that the people who created the list didn't know exactly what version of Zifu they were running, or maybe they were testing it out before a newer version was released. So there are actually different versions of the emulator that work better for some games than others. So this script allows you to go through and select which version of the Xenon emulator you're using to force your game in order to run, which might increase compatibility. Of course, there's also uh, now in the wiki different versions of that that you could take a look at and see. but. Overall, I just think this is really cool and it dials in, you know, it's a little bit of effort at first, but now you could really dial in getting Xbox games to run well on the 360 that weren't originally designed for that or the, uh, I shouldn't say that, I guess they weren't originally added to that Xenon Fusion emulator. Also, it's kind of funny because it turns out that Fus uh, Fusion Frenzy and Crimson Skies for the Xbox One X, which would actually run on a modified Xbox 360 because it, it emulates the 360, which in turn emulates the Xbox. So it's like, you know, two levels of inception deep of emulation here. I wonder how that affects latency or if they're able to bypass that and just have the, you know, route the controller buttons around it. I know I'm talking in general terms here. My programmers are just face palming about making fun of me very badly right now, but hopefully you know what I mean by that. But yeah, I mean, regardless, if you're into playing Xbox games on the 360, check out Durf's post and uh, see if this stuff might be helpful for when you're playing original Xbox games. Next up, Electron Shepard is now selling an HDMI pass-through adapter for the PlayStation 2 that's only $35, it's zero latency, and it may or may not be a good fit for your setup. There's a couple of things that you might want to note, which I'll get to in a second, that would make this a very bad choice for your setup, but there's also a couple of scenarios that might make this a really helpful choice or just a really great temporary choice. Then you have a nice tool in your toolbox when you're done. So let's walk through it. First of all, it is only compatible with the PlayStation 2 and you need to set it to output component video at right there in the menu, just that very basic setting. It will not work on the PlayStation 1 because the PlayStation 1 doesn't output component video. It only outputs RGB. However, it will work with PlayStation 1 games running on a PS2, provided your TV is compatible. And here's where we, get, where we get into the who is this for. So first of all, almost all of the PlayStation 2 library is 480i, and obviously most of the PS1 library is 240p with some 480i in there, which means that this will probably add a ton of latency to your display. Uh, when I did that myth busting uh, display lag video, which I have in the bottom of this post, if you're interested in it, it showed that there were well over 10 frames of lag in many cases, simply when switching to interlaced video. 
just because interlaced video is predominantly for TV signals. So latency doesn't matter. So that way you, the TV could take its time and do a really awesome clean job deinterlacing it. So if you're playing turn by turn role playing games or strategy games or basically anything where reaction time is not an issue, then this is not a worry whatsoever. And in fact, your TV might do a great job deinterlacing it. Um, also for the 240p stuff, the PlayStation 1, uh, a lot of TVs just accept all 15 kilohertz signals, so 240p and 480i, as if it were 480i. So some TVs might work, some TVs won't. Maybe it'll do a terrible job scaling it, maybe it'll do a passable job. However, there are still some awesome use cases for this. First, if um, you're just buying this to hold you off until you could afford like a Tink 4K or something, great. I love the perspective that people have had recently in the past couple of years of knowing that their solution is temporary and understanding that if they run into latency issues, it's not their setup, it's not their game, it's just, you know, their temporary solution for it. But what if you have a mod chipped PlayStation 2 and you're forcing almost all of your games to 480p? Now we're talking about a lot of money saved because now you can get a clean analog to digital conversion with this with no latency added. And if your TV is one of the ones that does a good job scaling 480p, then there's no need to purchase anything else. And that's a bit of a niche, but it's also very realistic that you've already chipped it. You're forcing most of your games to 480p. The ones that aren't forcible, maybe they're role-playing games and you don't need you know, fast reaction time. And that would be great. Uh, so that's definitely a good use for it. Another weird but completely and totally plausible use for this is PlayStation 3. And yes, I do realize the PS3 has an HDMI out, but it's also notorious for having the worst HDCP protection on there. So it basically doesn't work with any capture card whatsoever unless you get a splitter. So if you have a capture card that has pass-through, it might just be e easier and cheaper for you to get one of these plug it into the PS3 and then have the output of your card go to your TV or something like that. So that way you don't have to worry about HDCP. You could just stream and play as normal or record or whatever it is you're going to do. So there's definitely a, a good, uh, good chance there that that would be a help. The only thing that I wouldn't suggest that I did hear a couple of people mentioning is, oh, I'll just get this for use with a RetroTank 4K. I don't think that would be the best way to, to approach it because one of the things the Tink 4K and the Tink 5X in, in, many resp uh, in many respects has is the ability to do very good filtering on analog video signals. So having a, and this is not a dig on uh, Electron Shepard, I mean, having a $35 device do the analog to digital conversion versus a $750 device it better be, do a good job or do a better job because it's that much more expensive. But yeah, if your goal is really to go into the Tink 4K, I would strongly suggest just getting a pair of HD Retrovision component video cables and plugging that directly in and letting it do all of the conversion and filtering and all of that stuff. Once again, I'm not saying this is doing a bad job, but it's not fair to think that it's going to do as good of a job as a very expensive device that's designed to do this as good as possible. So... I wanted to put all that out there, not to crap on this thing, but just to give you perspective. I think this device is something a lot of people listening are going to end up buying for many reasons. I just don't want people to make the wrong assumption that this is something you could just plug into your PS2, plug into your average flat panel TV and have a great experience because you're at the mercy of the 480i library on a TV that's most likely going to add a ton of latency to deinterlace it. But I still think it's great. Links and uh, more info are in the description. And if you want more info on that display lag stuff, just check out that video I did a while back. Last week, I ended up doing that stream with Andy Sinden, the creator of the Sinden Light Gun, and I tried out the latest version of the Mr. Installation Kit, and everything worked really, really well. This is by far the easiest light gun on Mr. Experience I've had yet, and essentially, now all you do is run one script, that's it. It automatically downloads everything. Your mister obviously has to be connected to the internet, but it would automatically download everything that you need, including the custom cores that have everything built in. And then you just go in and you do basic core setup. How do you like your, how do you like it stretched? You know, do you have any custom commands you want mapped to the controller or anything like that? And that's it. It just worked and it worked really well. 
And there's a way to calibrate at basically any time where you would fire up the crosshair on Mr. You hold a button on the uh, light gun and it sets the crosshair to the middle. You just very carefully calibrate to that and that's it. And that, that stuck and that really worked. And in fact, when I walked around the room with the gun, obviously if I got up and I walked four feet diagonally in the other direction, it wasn't as accurate as the original spot, but it was still good enough to the point where, you know, I think anybody that's used original light guns today, even on original consoles on CRTs and everything, know that they're not the most accurate pieces of equipment. So I would say that this gun could be more accurate or has the potential to be at least more accurate if you calibrate it in one spot and stay there, but it's still a totally fine experience if you move around a little bit. So, uh, I think that this is really going to end up being an amazing choice for so many people just because of ease of use. All the uh, cores were pre-configured and everything. I had given Andy some tips in the stream on how to make the cores just a little more tweaked just to, so people could kind of get to the playing part even quicker, but absolutely not a necessity. And I just, I don't know, I think it's absolutely awesome. At the moment, Genesis, NES, SNES, PS1, Master System, and Atari 7800 are currently uh, working and have the custom cores running. And uh, there's a few other things that it's probably, I don't know if I would say it's missing, but it'd be nice if it ended up getting, and the big one is the analog video support. So, you know, why would you need to use this if you're using a CRT? Well, that's easy. Do you have snack adapters and original guns for every single console that you have? Uh, do you have a gun con setup? Because you could use that on some of them. Or did you already have a Sint and Light gun for use on a flat panel, but you also want to try it out on your CRT? So I think that would be pretty cool. Um, also, I did test it through the Tink 4K, and even with the scanline emulation on, it did still work. So that's not going to mess with it. So uh, I, I really, um, I think this thing is just awesome in every way. I, I would like to see direct video support for the border just because it would make all that stuff a little bit easier, both on CRTs and on the Tink 4K. But overall, this is just very cool. So, you know, if you were waiting for an easy light gun solution on the Mister, this is probably the one you've been waiting for. The gun for IR from JB is still absolutely amazing and has the potential to be even more accurate and even less latency, but it does require a lot more setup. You have to have sensors around your TV where this one, the sensor is part of the image. Um, so there's a bit more to it. And I believe you have to either buy pre-made ones uh, or you do it yourself. You have to buy a kit for it. So it's the JB Gun for IR solutions definitely more for the hardcore users. I believe Retro Ralph built like a, a Time Crisis style arcade machine using that, and I think that's the perfect uh, solution for that one because everything's all built in. Um, you could already make it, you know, a nice part of the whole setup. Whereas with this, this is really meant to, you know, any TV. You could switch between TVs. You could bring it to your friend's house. The border's right there. So nothing but good things to say. I'm looking forward to doing a follow-up stream with Andy at some point in the coming months just to see where it progresses to. And uh, if the Mr. Team feels like this is an easy integration, maybe the light gun border could just be part of Mr. So you don't need, you wouldn't need custom cores and it would just work in direct video if you just have it set to that. So the Mr. Team is obviously spending a lot of time working on a lot of things and this is perfectly playable as is. So if they feel it's a cool option, great. If not, it's still not a problem for anybody who uses it. So uh, check out the live stream and read the post if you want more info. The post sums everything up. The live stream walks you through it all pretty quickly. So uh, quickly for a Bob live stream. <laughs> My live streams are long and slow paced. So quickly, uh, you know, considering it's me. Um, and the the stuff that you need to know is at the beginning, at the end, and the end, in the middle of it's all the demo stuff. So thanks again to Andy. That was a blast. And definitely check out at least the post if you're interested. The developer Infidelity has just released his latest NES to Super Nintendo conversion, this time for the game Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. This version has original sound from the Famicom Disk uh, System version, as well as an MSC1 audio soundtrack, and uh, it has all of the stuff that you would expect from his conversions. So much less slowdown, if not no slowdown at all, uh, definitely drastically reduced sprite flicker and SNES related enhancements like, you know, RGB out from the console without a mod or just even things like MSU1 audio packs. 
Um, if you want to see this thing in action, I was actually able to do a live stream with my friend Clint Cronin, who I had on the podcast here one other time. And uh, I wanted him to join me because he is one of the few people I know that genuinely like this game. And I just never have. And the first part of the stream is him walking me through it and kind of showing me, you know, I guess there's a bit of spoilers because I go through the first castle, but it's really, you know, I think it would be a very big help for somebody who wants to get into this game, who wants some beginner tips, who wants to be walked through what some of it's like. And I really tried my best to like it, but I still just don't. And, you know, I want to like the game. It's a Zelda game. I, I want to find a hidden gem Zelda that I could play and love, but it's just not the same as one and three. It's a completely different thing, and it's not for me. However, the second half of the stream, Clint was able to go through, and he played it. We swapped over to streaming on his end, and it was really able to show you how enjoyable it could be if you get into it. You know, he shows some tricks, he blows through some areas, and it just, it's really neat to see. So... Yeah, thanks again for Infidelity for always doing these. Whether I like the game or not doesn't mean I think it's any less important. I think it's absolutely awesome that we have both NES Zelda games converted over now. So thanks. Please support the developer if you want uh, any more of these because you know these take a long time and a lot of effort. So I always like to show my support even though these are completely free. No one has to. And also thanks to Clint for being patient and walking me through all of this stuff. Also, Clint's going to be at a booth in California Extreme this weekend. So if you want to go see Clint and say hi, uh, you know, bring your copy of Zelda 2 and take a picture with him or something. But yeah, uh, you know, thanks again to Clint and Infidelity. And it's really cool that we have this one converted, but I think that might be the last time I ever try Zelda 2. There are now three alternatives to the DE10 Nano, the heart of the Mr. Project, and Lou from Lou's Retro Source spent this week giving us basic updates. I'm going to very quickly run through them, but check out Lou's video if you want more info. First up, the boards from Taki Udon are in mass production. The first batch will probably sell out, but the goal of this project is really to keep them in stock, not to do small drops. It's obviously a smart move and it makes total sense that the first batch isn't giant get them out in the wild make sure there was nothing unforeseen but these uh, are really meant to be drop-in replacements you might need the different cables it comes with but for all intents and purposes this should be a one-to-one -one replacement of the original with a couple of little tweaks you could use it in existing kits or use the kit that taki is going to be selling with it the io board and the usb um, now, there's no official sale date, but I don't think it would be too long from now, so good news there. The other boards are both from QM Tech, and one of them has RAM built in and the other one doesn't. And a couple of quick things to note, the one with RAM built in says dual RAM chips, but it's not dual RAM. They just mean they're using two 64 megabyte chips to accomplish the 128, which is fine. It's just a little confusing if you're going into that thinking it's a dual RAM model. Now you could add another RAM stick to that, essentially making it dual RAM, uh, but that one's up to you. Those boards, neither of them are gonna be compatible with any existing kits though. You'd have to use the QM tech stuff or hope that somebody else makes them. And I kind of got, uh, I don't know. I, I, I just I'm being very cautious about this one, both because you can't just use it with existing ones, but also there's some concern. Uh, Koala Koa got one of the boards uh, without the built-in RAM. It came with a power supply, an SD card, and a fan with double-sided sticky tape. The power supply uh, basically is cheap and probably dangerous. It looks flimsy. It doesn't look like it's well-built. Uh, I'm not sure if the... if uh, I don't... Yeah, there is a CE rating on there, but there's not much other info on there, which kind of doesn't give me much confidence on that one. So I would agree, I wouldn't buy any of that stuff with it. Um, and it does seem to run kind of hot. So I don't know, I, Koala started to write up a post on Retro RGB about it, but I was planning on jumping in and helping out with all of it. Some crazy stuff happened this week, so I wasn't able to finish it. Uh, and then Lou started covering it. So hopefully Lou and Koala could work together to kind of get a decent review out. My apologies to Koala. Sorry for not getting your post out like I promised to just trying to juggle so much. And when Lou already got it in his video, I just figured in, in reference to Koala, I've just figured that's better than I could do at the moment. So if you want more details on this and some pictures, please check out Lou's video. We'll keep everybody posted. Um, I'm not writing off the QM tech boards. I just 
just think we need a lot more info before I start to just blindly recommend them, especially how could you get it working? What accessories are there? How does it perform? What's the heat? What's everything else like? There's just a lot of questions to be answered on both. It's just Taki's been so um, upfront and honest about everything. I feel like I already know what to expect with that one. So please uh, check out Lou's video, subscribe to Lou. And if you rely on Lou as much as I do, consider supporting on Patreon because I couldn't keep up with all this stuff as much as he does and couldn't do it without him. Next up, there's a new firmware for the Datapath Vision capture cards that prevents OBS blue screens with resolution changes. If you don't care about any of this stuff, skip to the next section, but if you're even mildly interested in the Datapath Vision capture cards or stuff like this, stick with me. Uh, let me start from the beginning. Datapath Vision capture cards, the E1, E1S, E2S, are old by today's standards and incredibly expensive if you buy them new. However, they're fairly cheap used and they're pretty incredible pieces of equipment. You could have HDMI input via cheap converter up to uh, definitely 1080p 60. Some of the versions could do 1440p, I believe. And you could do that completely uncompressed. So 444 color space, uh, to true lossless video, which is a kind of a big deal if you're somebody who does video analysis. But they're also able to take VGA component video and RGB SCART via something like the SCART cleaner for direct capture. Direct capture, to be polite but blunt, is not something most people would care about. 99.9% .9 of people, including reviewers, should probably just be using a retro tank to, instead of, uh, or maybe even an OBS, uh, OBS, geez, an OSSC. But for people that want to archive original square pixel resolution and also do one-to-one -one comparisons without any of the filtering or compensation that the retro tanks have, which is a really great thing if you're playing or, or streaming, but not a great thing if you're doing video signal analysis and you want that raw signal. Um, so most people don't need any of this stuff. But if you do, if you want this, then the Datapath Visions are absolutely awesome. Um, they, I believe I still see them on eBay for between 40 and 100 bucks. They could do so many different things. Uh, and the only problem I've had with it recently is when I opened up OBS, if I changed the resolution, it would blue screen. And that actually was the result of me killing a couple live streams that I did. Luckily, shout out to EposVox, the stream professor taught me how to do this schedule stream so I could just reboot the computer and jump back in without having to start a new stream. But yeah, that, that was annoying. So this blue screen fix, uh, or this firmware update fixes that. You don't get the blue screen anymore. Um, and the only other thing to note is the HDMI input on this. It's actually a DVI-D, so you just need a cheap HDMI to DVI cable. You don't need any active converter. However, because these things are, well, no capture card is PS3 compatible, and it does not accept audio at all, and it needs some kind of HDMI chip on there or, or else you'll get green speckles. That $20 HDMI splitter audio extractor thing I recommended uh, is definitely what you should pair with this or anything like it. So if you are going to use one of these things for any of those reasons, as long as you're using HDMI, you should get one of those as well. Um, the only other thing to add, and please skip this if you're not a capture nerd, I don't want to bore everybody to death, but if anybody from the R3 wiki is listening or anybody out there who's really good at video processing, I've been running into one issue forever that I don't know how to solve. Um, in order to do the proper scaling and aspect ratio cor correction for original um, consoles, whether it's direct capture or through the OSSC, you first get square pixels, you have everything calibrated, you have phase set, and you capture that way. Then after the fact, you scale it and then you correct for the aspect ratio, which is either going to make it squished or wider to have it presented properly. So for video analysis, you leave them in square pixels, you zoom in, and you're good to go. Yes, the aspect ratio is wrong, but if you're doing video analysis where you're really trying to check for interference, color quality, signal integrity, all of that stuff, it's fine. But what if you're capturing direct because you want a small file size, a lossless small file size, and then you want to scale later? The methods that I was using for still pictures is fine. You could even use nearest neighbor to stretch it, which doesn't make sense because it's not an integer, but for still images, it works out totally fine. However, 
whenever there's movement on the screen, if you do in non-integer nearest neighbor scale, you get bad shimmering. Whereas if you use other methods like bilinear sharp, which is what the Tink 4K uses, then that'll stretch it out where it's not as sharp, but you retain the integrity of the image and there's no shimmering. How do you do that in post? None of the plugins I found for virtual dub worked at all, not even close. They all just smeared the image and totally destroyed it. And uh, I only tried one or two plugins for Premiere and it did the same thing, including Premiere's internal scaling. Uh, and that is using any combination of anything, you know, whether I scale it to 4K in square pixels and try to stretch that way, whether I try to do it all inside these video editing uh, softwares. So does anybody have an easy way to either get bilinear sharp into virtual dub or into Premiere or Resolve? Is there any tricks? Is there anything I'm missing? You know, hopefully I just could have the help of the community for this because it's not just direct capture. What if you're using the OSSC with square pixels? Uh, what if you're using um, emulation and you just want to, for the same reason, save original sized screenshots and videos, which are very small in file size, and then you, you know, record an entire gameplay, and then you only chop out the bits that you need and scale those to 1080p or 4K, you're going to have the same issue. You could do it all optimized and then uh, to get it to size, but when you correct for aspect ratio, that's where there's going to be some issues. So if anybody could help out with that, please, please let me know. Uh, I'll update the guide. I'll teach everybody else how to do it too. I'll credit you, of course, but that's the one thing. So funny enough, if you're actually somebody who really wants the best captures for presentation for anything other than like deep video analysis, the Tink 4K is the winner because it compensates for all of that stuff, including aspect ratio while retaining the sharpness. Uh, it's only probably five people in the world I know that might need exactly what I'm talking about. But I think if we really chronicled this and I did another follow-up video and I made a clearer guide, I, I hope more people would do that because then you could really... I guess the aspect ratio bugs me. I see so many historians showing game footage that's either too thin or too fat because it's not the way it was supposed to be seen. And it, that just bugs me because I don't know. I don't know why it bugs me because I'm a nerd, I, I, whatever. But if you could help with that one, please let me know. Next up, Crix just released a fully open source ROM cart for the Sega Genesis Mega Drive called the Open ED. And this is kind of an interesting product and a bit of a niche thing, but I think it has the potential to be pretty amazing, especially considering the open source nature. So the price came to about $40, which included shipping to the New York City area, which is about the same as the EverDrive X3. Quick side note, I forgot the X3 was that cheap uh, when I wrote this post originally, so I edited it a, a little bit. But uh, I guess when I first bought my X3 to test, it was a lot more expensive than that. So I'm not sure if you would buy this over that one if they were both available. I did because I, I want to support Cricks and all open source software because um, this one doesn't have any CPU or FPGA built in. It just has, uh, it's built using memory and discrete logic, which means no special chip support. So no FM sound for Master System, no virtual racing. It also means no Sega CD emulation, no save states, no instant loading. And larger games can take probably up to a minute to load but once they're loaded in memory, the next time you boot, it's an instant load after that. So this one's kind of kind of interesting. I'm not really sure if this is the one to go to if you're on a budget. Uh, I definitely bought one because, you know, for all the right reasons. But I'm wondering where people can take this. Is this something that could be made into a uh, Japanese Master System or the MK2000 ROM cart? So essentially you would have to reroute it on a different board and make a couple of changes, but that's not something that exists. You have to, at the moment, buy the master EverDrive and then put it in that converter that I talked about a couple months ago, which is a perfectly good solution, but it's also expensive. If this costs 40 bucks to make, um, that means even in really small quantities, you might be able to have something with a nice case in it for the, you know, in a nice MK2000 shell for less than you could do that. So let me know your thoughts on this one. Uh, kind of funny that I just forgot that the X3 was that cheap, but my enthusiasm is still high for this. It's just, what do you think this could be used for? Take a look at the GitHub, see what you think about the design. Um, can this be ported to other stuff like that? Can this be used to make a Master System or MK2000 cheap open source version of the cart? 
I don't know. I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on it, especially all the, the many, many people much smarter than me that would actually be able to dig into that design and see what they could do. But either way, thanks to Crix for doing this. I mean, I think it's absolutely awesome. There's no reason that he had to. This is just another neat project, and maybe we'll just see it get picked up and evolve into different things. Next up, Yehel from Wrestling With Gaming just posted his latest documentary, this one on the failed physical PlayStation Store. No, not the Sony style stores that also failed, but this was one that happened before that. And it was one store, and it was meant to be a giant big deal, and it just kind of wasn't. So it was a good story. It's also a short one. So even if you're only mildly interested in this, I would strongly recommend watching it anyway because it's a short but fun one. And, uh, you know, I like both of Yehel's styles of documentaries. My favorite are the deep dive ones. The x band documentary is still my favorite. I talk about that here. Uh, making a Game Boy was also really awesome. But I also like his shorter ones because I, you know, what if it's a subject I'm not super into, I don't really have the extra hour to put into, but a 15 minute video to see something fun like this? Absolutely. So strongly recommend, I mean, I recommend all his videos because I like them, but he's not paying me to say that or anything. I talk about them because I genuinely like them and want to share them with everybody. So check this one out. Well, that's it for this time. Thanks to everybody who watches, listens, plays nicely in the comments, and especially thank you to everybody who supports in absolutely any way, because it really is you who's keeping all this stuff alive. So thank you all so much, and I'll see you next week. This week's roundup is brought to you by Neo Paradigm Entertainment, connecting Southeast Asian influencers with opportunities in the West.